Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us on our webinar this afternoon, UDAP, the CFPB's Emerging and Evolving Doctrine. I'm Allison Baker. I'm a partner here at Venable, and I focus my practice primarily on uh, CFPB-related and consumer finance-related investigations and derivative litigation. And I'm very excited to tell you about the panel of folks that we have joining us today. You will be hearing from my colleague, Meredith Boylan, who is a litigator um, in our practice group here in Washington. Meredith has spent the better part of a decade working on financial services investigations and derivative litigation as well. She's handled matters that uh, relate to the FDIC and has an extensive CFPB practice. Prior to joining Venable, Meredith was an assistant district attorney in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And today Meredith is going to share with you her perspective on how law enforcement generally views civil investigations of this type and specifically how the UDAP doctrine as it uh, concerns the CFPB is being deployed. We are also going to hear from my other colleague, Katie Wright. Katie Wright is an attorney who also works with us here in D.C. in our litigation practice. Katie has spent the better part of the last three years working uh, on a lot of CFPB-related matters. She has spent a fair amount of time arguing and litigating the questions of what unfairness means, what deception doctrine means, and what abusive doctrine means. And Katie today is going to give, her, give us her insights into how that doctrine is evolving and how it compares to similar and comparable uh, other regimes in the law enforcement world. Finally, we're going to hear from Jennifer McCabe. Jennifer McCabe is the vice pres a vice president at Cornerstone Research here in Washington, D.C. Jennifer uh, regularly consults with companies that are being investigated by the CFPB and other law enforcement agencies in the consumer finance space. And Jennifer spends a lot of her time, if not all of her practice, on thinking about and advising clients on how they should be thinking about damages as they relate to and concern actions in the UDAP world. And so we'll be hearing from Jennifer in that regard as well. So thank you very much for joining us. I want to remind everybody that today's event is being recorded and broadcasted through your computer speakers. Please be sure they are turned on and the volume is turned up. And please use the chat feature if you experience an issue with the audio quality, and we'll immediately respond accordingly. And uh, if you'd like to ask us questions, similarly, please use the chat feature and feel free to pose questions. We will be um, peppering our dialogue today with responses to the questions that come in, and we'll try and do our very best to answer all of the questions that come in. Um, in addition, I want to note that you can use the following dial-in for audio, 877 410-4798, conference ID 7906418. And for the end of the program, we will be providing you with the CLE information that you need as well. So thank you so much. So today I want to start by talking about the agenda for the day's webinar. We're going to discuss a little bit about the Dodd-Frank Act and UDAP provisions generally and, and what that means. I'll be talking about that. We're going to be talking about the types of actions that the CFPB has considered to be UDAP violations um, and how law enforcement agencies think about those things. Meredith Boylan will lead us in that discussion. We're going to talk about UDAP and the CFPB's interpretation of that doctrine and how it's both derivative from and deviations from other agency regimes, and Katie Wright will lead us in that discussion. And finally, we'll be talking about uh, the kinds of damages that are starting to uh, manifest themselves when UDAP violations are found. And uh, Jennifer McCabe will be leading us in that discussion, and all of us will be discussing and talking about how you can identify and remediate potential UDAP violations in your compliance management systems on a going forward basis. And we look forward to today's uh, conversation. So first, I just want to give everybody a very high-level overview of UDAP. Um, as everybody on this call probably knows by now, um, the CFPB, of course, has been in existence for uh, more than five years. It started, it opened its doors on July 21, 2011. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act was passed on July 21, 2010. And Title 10 of the Dodd-Frank Act is the Consumer Financial Protection Act which is the enabling statute for the CFPB. And as part of that statute, Sections 1031 and 1036 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which are codified as 12 U.S.C. 5531 and 5536, 
spell out the nature of the CFPB's UDAP doctrine. UDAP being prohibitions against unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. And I just want to give a few high-level thoughts here about this um, to get us started today. Unfairness is not specifically defined in the Dodd-Frank Act, um, except as to say, or I should say it is defined in the Dodd-Frank Act, but it's, its definition is really one that is borrowed pretty heavily from existing Federal Trade Commission doctrine. And, and so it's defined insofar as there's a very specific standard that's prescribed in the Dodd-Frank Act, but if you read it and you marry it up against existing Section 5 Federal Trade Commission Act doctrine, you'll see that it's almost identical to what is considered to be unfairness doctrine. Similarly, there's deception, um, which is spelled out um, in, in Section 1031 by simply um, describing what deception is. But deception doctrine, like unfairness doctrine here, is really borrowed pretty heavily from Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. And that is more a function of how the CFPB has applied the deception standard in 1031 because the actual language in the statute doesn't specify like it does for unfairness. But the provision that perhaps captures the, uh, the most discussion or attention concerns abusive. And what does abusive mean? And abusive is a new standard, meaning that it is not uh, previously, it hasn't previously been delineated quite like this in other statutory regimes, which is different than unfairness and deception. And abuse, abusive, of course, is defined in the Dodd-Frank Act, but I always like to give a, a, a shorter definition because I think it's instructive as we proceed today and as we go forward thinking about this. Abusive is essentially two things. Abusive is defined to capture instances when the CFPB perhaps perceives certain conduct or practices to take unfair or unreasonable advantage of a particularly vulnerable consumer segment. That's not to say that only vulnerable consumer segments are susceptible to this, uh, to this standard, but that its particular focus is on that. And what I mean by vulnerable consumer segment is, for example, students, senior citizens, in some contexts perhaps minorities, in some contexts perhaps women, um, people for whom English might not be a first language. If you talk about a rapid fire marketing technique where you're explaining a very complicated financial services product to people, and you're deliberately targeting a community where English may not be the predominant language, and you're targeting that community in rapid-fire English, that might be an example of something the Bureau could find abusive. And so that's conceptually one way to think about abusive. Another way to think about abusive, um, because it is a relatively new standard here, is to think about it as something that is designed to perhaps capture conduct that might not fall into the traditional category of unfair or deceptive, but is nevertheless the kind of conduct that perhaps isn't lawful or shouldn't be lawful or frankly just seems wrong. And, and generally speaking, those are the two kind of big categories that I like to think about when I think about what abusive means because frankly we get asked that question a lot and short of just reading the statute, there isn't yet a lot of common law or even settlements, consent orders, that describe with great detail what this standard means. So I want to talk a little bit about that fact for a moment, and then I'm gonna, we're going to talk about how the Bureau thinks about UDAP as evidenced through its uh, recent enforcement actions, and also generally how law enforcement uh, agencies think about building out legal doctrine. Um, a couple of points. So the Dodd-Frank Act contemplates a scenario where, in theory, the CFPB could promulgate regulations that define what unfairness means, that define what deception means, that define what abusive means, but I think it's fair to say that that's probably not happening anytime soon. Most law enforcement agencies, the Department of Justice comes to mind, Securities and Exchange Commission come to mind, choose to not necessarily delineate through rulemaking, um, the IRS comes to mind, they don't always delineate through rulemaking exactly what their doctrine is because rulemaking is seen as two things. It's seen as being relatively confining and it's seen as addressing specific conduct as opposed to whole categories of conduct that the Bureau might want to address. So the CFPB for many reasons, um, strategic flexibility, is likely to continue to build out its UDAP doctrine through consent orders, and litigation. 
And I think that's very important to understand because occasionally we'll hear conversations from people who say, when are they going to promulgate a rule? I, I think the answer is probably not anytime soon. So we should be thinking about what we can glean from consent orders, what we can glean from civil litigation, what we can glean from other um, similar doctrines, namely those concerning the Federal Trade Commission Act, et cetera. And with that, I'm going to ask Meredith to start talking to us about how the CFPB thinks in terms of UDAP, what we should be thinking about, and generally speaking, given her extensive law enforcement experience, both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, what she sees emerging from all of this. Thanks, Allison. There are two areas that I think are very interesting when it comes to thinking about how the Bureau is pursuing its investigations and its enforcement actions, particularly with UDAP. And I've drawn these from my, my two different experiences on both sides of the table, one as a prosecutor and the second as a defense attorney. The, the prosecutorial nature of, of my experience, thinking back on that, I, I when I was being trained, I, I learned about the broken windows theory. And it's a kind of a controversial theory now. It's, it's, was a method of policing that was used at one point in New York, and the theory behind it was if you prosecute the little crimes and police the little crimes, they're going to lead to discovery of larger crimes, larger connections, larger organizations. And so the belief was if you catch the guy jumping the turnstile and police him and run his fingerprints, maybe you'll find out that he was actually committing robberies in a neighborhood, or maybe he has connections to a group of a criminal enterprise. And I, I see based on the experience that I've had with the CFPB that, that they may be taking a similar approach in sussing out violations of UDAP and using what may seem like one-off um, issues to paint, to, to give them a, like a wormhole into a larger pattern of potential misconduct. And so what we may find is that while the CFPB in its supervisory role or perhaps even in um, a non-party CID could be asking for what seems like a fairly innocuous request and you may provide them with perhaps recordings or uh, different documents that that what they learn on those recordings, what we may think is a one-off type situation, perhaps an operator forgot to give an, a disclosure or misrepresented by accident the terms of a particular product, that the CFPB may use that what seems to be a, a, a one-time deal to explore whether there's a larger pattern of misconduct afoot. And so I think it's, you know, it's very important as your organization's um, deal with the CFPB in both a supervisory capacity and perhaps in an enforcement capacity that, you know, everybody is thinking about where the CFPB might be going and why are they interested in what seems like a very small, discreet incident. And it may be that they have a, a suspicion that there's a larger problem afoot and that that small, discreet incident leads them to explore more um, avenues perhaps expand their investigation to pull in other business units, other policies, other procedures, and that it becomes much more of a substantial investigation than originally anticipated. And so I think that that's something that, you know, we certainly bear in mind as, as we're assessing where the Bureau might be going. The other side, the flip side of that is as a defense attorney in dealing with um, other regulatory agencies, I came to, to be able to review a lot of um, exam reports and different items that the regulators had prepared for entities that they regulated prior to the Great Recession. And one thing that, that jumped out at, at us is that prior to the Great Recession, an, an, an agency may be reviewed, I'm sorry, an entity may be reviewed and conduct may have been identified, but the regulatory agencies were nonetheless awarding these banks, these entities, fairly good supervisory marks. Um, and so we were able to leverage that from a defense standpoint and argue that because the agencies had essentially given 
passing grades to these entities that they couldn't come back on the back end and argue that these entities had somehow deviated from the standard of conduct. Meredith, can I ask you a question about that? Because I know that you handled a case that um, became a, a, a big deal in the Fourth Circuit in which I think that exact argument was made as it related to the FDIC. And I'm wondering, you know, the CFPB in many ways is much more aggressive about how it, it conducts examinations in some instances. But do you see any parallels between the defense you put forward in that case, which you won, and what we might be seeing now in terms of supervision and what, how supervision is interacting with enforcement at the Bureau? Because you, you've got a firm yeah. seat to a lot of this, I think. I, I do. I think that the, the, the more rigid supervision and supervision leading to enforcement is perhaps a reaction to the types of defenses that we were able to put forth um, successfully in this post-recession litigation. Um, you know, I think the agencies are much more cognizant of how their reports and the reports of examination and so forth might be considered by a court going forward should there be an allegation that a particular entity acted negligently or, or was grossly negligent in the way that it handled its operations. And perhaps, you know, you could expand that to other types of allegations as well. And so it, it appears to me that the CFPB is being much more um, rigid in setting up boundaries between itself and the entities that it regulates and is being much more um, aggressive in pursuing enforcement, perhaps stemming from its supervision activities um, so as not to find itself in a position three, five, ten years down the line where it has taken a soft uh, approach to regulating its, its entities and, and is therefore precluded from litigating against it or pursuing enforcement against it down the line. And you're seeing, um, and I'm going to switch a little bit here, um, but we're seeing some of the uh, focus points as well in the non-bank space as well as the bank space. And um, maybe you and Katie can talk a little bit about some of the areas that we see the Bureau focusing on in the non-bank space. And, you know, one of the things I want to point out um, to, to everybody, although I'm sure most everybody who's listening knows this, um, prior to the, the CFPB's existence, uh, starting in July of 11, there wasn't a federal agency that had examination authority over non-bank financial services providers. And so this is really a very new world. It's only five years old. It's a relatively new world for a lot of non-banks. And even those non-banks that um, maybe aren't subject to the CFPB's examination authority are nevertheless subject to the CFPB's enforcement authority. As and, and that enforcement authority, of course, is, is mostly but not exclusively manifested through UDAP. Um, and so I think that there, you know, we're starting to see a, a convergence of a few things. We're seeing a, a much more, to Meredith's point, a much more aggressive approach to enforcement post-recession, post-Great Recession. But we're also seeing a focus on certain non-bank sectors. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. And then Katie, if you can kind of talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of how, how these doctrines are emerging given the, the particular focus on non-banks because that is somewhat different than prior, you know, prior to Dodd-Frank where you had a very considered and, and deliberate banking regime that both dealt with safety and soundness and consumer protection. Um, and so a lot of the larger banks that are subject to this aren't, it's not as new to them although it's still new to them, it's not quite as new to them as it is for some non-banks. And I, I think that, that those are points worth mentioning. Sure. So, uh, you know, the CSPB and I think in conjunction with leaders like Elizabeth Warren have certainly focused in on some industries that are getting perhaps an unfair amount of attention. Um, student lending and all of the components of that, both servicing, collections, uh, lending itself are certainly receiving a lot of scrutiny from the CFPB. And so, you know, we're seeing that companies that work in this space are being scrutinized for, you know, not only the terms and conditions of the different uh, products that they offer, but also what kind of uh, disclosures are being made, how disputes are being handled, how consumers are being treated when they call in to 
work out servicing of a debt or dispute a debt. And all of those responses from the entities are being fly specced by the CFPB. And a lot of the enforcement actions that, that we've been monitoring result from you know, misstatements or alleged mischaracterizations of different terms, conditions, servicing options, promotions, et cetera. Um, th that also flows into the, the, the lawsuit space and lawsuits flowing from student lending, from mortgage lending, from the various lending activities. Um, and that, of course, pulls in banks, non-banks, you know, different types of lenders, credit repair, service providers. And so it really is an industry that has so many spokes and the agency seems to be really interested in every single spoke in that wheel. Um, and then, of course, there's also been a renewed or a, an interest on the agency's part in small dollar lending, short-term lending. And what we're studying right now, the different proposals that the agency has with respect to street, uh, standardizing that process. And so we expect that once those rules are implemented, they will be uh, following up and making sure that those rules are being implemented, followed, and complied with by the entities that operate in that uh, small dollar lending space as well. So those are just two of the areas where we know that the CFPB is, is focused like a laser beam at this point. Katie, you've, um, you've spent a lot of time as, over the last few years um, working with a lot of us here at Venable on this doctrine, UDEP. And I know that in your work you've, you've researched not only what the law actually says, but one of the challenges but also really interesting things about this area of the law is that we're, we're constantly looking outside of it for analogs because it's so new. And Katie, I know in particular, is, is one of the people who spent a lot of time doing that. And I'm wondering if you can, kind of building on what Marius has said, talk to us a little bit about some of what you've seen in terms of analogs. Um, and by analogs, I mean deception doctrine, unfairness doctrine, but also some of the process analogs that are up on our screen right now. Um, and if you can tell us two things, really. One, um, you know, what your research or what you see kind of emerging. And two, how we make sense of all of this. Because, for example, the only way often you can explain a relatively new legal concept or doctrine is to refer to something that came before it. But that's not often a perfect reference. It's an approximation. And um, I know in particular you've spent a lot of time on those ideas, Katie. So perhaps you can help us out here. Sure. Sure. So I think, you know, what Meredith said about um, these sort of older doctrines being applied to different industries um, is sort of the crux of this, is crux of this issue. Um, you know, you have the established deception and unfairness doctrine from the FTC, but you have it now being applied to entities and companies that it was never applied to before. So what we've really tried to do is sort of look at those doctrines and pull from it what we can. Um, um, into these into these new industries. So, um, for example, um, you know, there's there misrepresentation under the, under the deception doctrine. That that's really vague. It could really be anything, um, and that's I think probably the easiest the easiest claim for for the CFPB to make. Um, so we really have to dig into our clients' advertising, and what they say on their websites and their scripts, um, what they say to, to anyone that calls in. Um, those representations are really being scrutinized on a different level than they were than they were previously. Um, Some of the process issues, because it isn't just the legal doctrine itself, you know, looking to Section 5 deception doctrine or unfairness doctrine, but also uh, the way that some of these enforcement issues in particular are being used and looked at and, you know, not just UDAP, but for example, NORA, the NORA process, and, you know, that's similar to, but it's not exactly like the SEC Wells Notice. How do you, how do we reconcile those things and give people a good line of sight into what to expect? Sure. I find that that's something we get asked a lot. Sure. So for, for those of you that don't know, a NORA is a notice and opportunity to respond and advise. Um, in theory, it is supposed to come at the end of a CFPB investigation um, when they're sort of deciding whether to move forward, whether to bring an enforcement action, whether to sue, whether to settle. 
Um, that may not always be the case, but again, in theory, that is that is how it's supposed to, to be, which is very similar to the Wells notice um, process with the SEC. Um, one difference is that the SEC Wells notice generally is in writing. Um, there's sort of something you can refer back to. The CFPB NORA process is all oral. Um, you basically get a phone call and you write furiously, um, trying to capture all of the all of the alleged um, wrongdoings of your client. Um, so it's a bit, it's, it's different in that, you know, you're only responding to what you can actually write. write. Um, and, you know, I, I think that gives the Bureau a bit more cover later on. Um, but, you know, in theory, it's supposed to be similar to the Wells Notice. Um, we've also seen, you know, the Bureau taking some statutes or rules that um, that may not have been previously enforced by the by certain agencies that have promulgated them, and sort of um, advancing them in a new a new way. So that's one other thing we have to keep an eye out for is you know regulations, rules, laws that you know previously were not enforced or were enforced in a different way. The bureau is sort of taking a different spin on them, and that's something that companies and we as lawyers really have to look out for. So, so one of the other points that we have up on our screen is abusive is a new concept and can apply as a gap filler. And I want to want to ask you a couple questions about that. Um, by gap filler, I, you know, uh, what we mean by that, I think, and, and Katie, can, we can talk about this, is the idea that if there's a practice or a conduct out there that just doesn't seem right and maybe should be unlawful, that maybe doesn't fit into the perfect doctrine that's been pre-established, you know, deception doctrine or unfairness doctrine, abusive is kind of a catch-all or a quote-unquote gap filler. The other thing that I think we see a lot of, and this really concerns the other components of the UDAP doctrine, is when the CFPB pursues a cause of action under one of the 19 or 18 enumerated consumer finance laws, sometimes there's conduct that is sort of part of that but gets brought in by UDAP as well. And so UDAP is both um, a catch-all, if you will, but also a way for the agency to enhance its existing uh, consumer finance doctrine. And we have a question here about whether we think the inclusion of abusive actually makes it harder for the CFPB to prove its cases because it's an additional doctrine. And I would say it's probably not really harder or easier. It's probably the case that because abusive is a new, it's a new area of the law. There isn't any real doctrine interpreting it, and there isn't any derivative doctrine to which you can refer. That the bureau has somewhat of a clean slate in how it goes about approaching it. But Katie um, is uniquely situated to tell us about this particular issue because are there any analogs out there for abusive? Uh, there, there's not a lot out there. I mean, there is some, there is some abusive language in the FTC Act and other, in the Telemarketing Sales Act, Telemarketing Sales Rule, um, but there's not a lot really out there for us to go on. Um, and when, when I put gap filler on this, on this slide, that's exactly what I was saying is, you know, abusive is sort of something that feels wrong. Um, it's, that's not a helpful, a helpful thing for businesses, but it's sort of something that doesn't perfectly fit into the deceptive doctrine, into the unfairness doctrine. It's different. In some ways, I see it as being more egregious conduct, um, but not, not necessarily. It's just something that's different um, and that the Bureau sort of has this, this blank slate to go out and, and tell us what it believes abusive conduct is. So Jennifer, you've spent a lot of your time um, focused on the damages component of this. So we, we're talking a lot about the establishing a liability, but you, you're, you often are brought in, I imagine, after liability might be a foregone conclusion, and now we're talking about what does damages look like. And I'm curious how you have looked at other existing legal doctrines out there and incorporated, for example, restitution doctrine under the FTC Act into your damages analysis and what you're seeing in the UDAP context, if you can tell us a little bit about that. Okay, right. so um, you're absolutely right. Uh, I was thinking about this when you talked to me. Um, when you think about damages, damages are, uh, the, the approach to damages is pretty universal, or it should be anyway. Um, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're thinking in particular about uh, a practice that harms consumers, you need to figure out how many consumers you have that were harmed, and then you have to come up with a dollar amount to attach to that harm. And um, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty straightforward like, concept. 
Um, but both elements of that can be extraordinarily challenging. Um, in trying to figure out the number of consumers that were harmed, um, you, there are several uh, challenges that you might encounter. One of them has to do with just uh, um, an interplay with the, sort of the, uh, the notion of misunderstanding or deception and things like that. Um, that um, uh, so so in, in, one, in one sense, there's a role to play here that's not necessarily liability has already been established, but you can look at um, uh, your customer's behavior and, and look at uh, how they respond, or, you know, how they act and try to use that as a way to inform the notion of were they misled, were they deceived, did they understand. So in particular, if you're thinking about um, something like um, it, it, it maybe something with an allegedly um, you know, too high interest rate, you might think of some of these uh, um, uh, small dollar lending type products or things like that, um, where the loans have a very high interest rate um, and maybe the disclosures about the interest rate are not um, uh, as ideal as you might hope. Um, and notwithstanding that, a large number of the consumers, you can see, repay those in a way that shows they understood the cost associated to the uh, loans. And what you can do, um, if you have good data, <laughs> um, that tells you um, how many people were exposed to a certain type of disclosure and how many maybe might have gotten a better disclosure and you could see that maybe they don't behave any differently. Maybe um, you could look at uh, the people who got uh, the better disclosure behaved in a, only a tiny different way and you can sort of quantify that. That will help you to understand both the scope of the people who are at issue in this, um, in this uh, investigation um, but also uh, uh, help you to make your arguments about the underlying conduct itself. Um, so that's uh, one way. And the other side of the equation, you know, thinking about your, who's affected, I think is very important, but also thinking about so how do you quantify the harm to that person um, is also, as you might imagine, uh, extraordinarily challenging. Um, and here is where I think I, the CFPB, I think, is departing a little bit from what I see um, uh, in other um, uh, agencies and also um, just in general uh, civil litigation. Um, in, um, you know, in, the, in the damages world, we always think about something called the but-for world, right? So, but for this bad conduct, what would the world have looked like? Um, and then when you think about those two worlds, the actual world where the bad conduct happened and then the but-for world, the difference between, uh, you know, the cost to the consumer or other elements, that, that's your damages. That's how you capture that. And um, it doesn't seem to me that the CFPB is doing a comparison like that, as, uh, a straightforward comparison like that in, uh, in a lot of their uh, uh, approaches to sort of redress, consumer redress, um, and, uh, and and some examples of that. Um, you know, I think that they're not. If if you were thinking about a, a fee that uh, was associated with a product that you thought was marketed in a misleading or deceptive way, um, they uh, tend to be saying, uh, give us back the entirety of that fee and any subsequent follow-on fees that might have resulted from that fee. They're not doing an assessment, I think, of, you know, what um, in the but-for world where this had been properly disclosed or the terms had properly been disclosed, what might have happened there. There are some people probably who still would have chosen to get the product or who would have appreciated those benefits and so on. And they're not, I think, awarding any credit for that in their, uh, in their approach to, uh, to damages. Um, I was struck by something you said before um, about how you're not always, when you're assessing damages, called, called in once the first prong of liability has been established. And what, what jumped out at me was, in UDAP doctrine, unfairness requires some showing of substantial injury. That's an element of unfairness. Right. How do you marry that, for example, up with your damages assessment and what you do in, in the normal course of assessing a 
you know, the CFPB comes in and they, they propound the civil investigative demand, they pursue an investigation, they come back after their NORA process and they say, okay, we think you've engaged in X, Y, and Z conduct. We believe that, among other things, that's unfair. Mm -hmm. Tell us why we're wrong. Right. And we call you and we say, okay, here's, here's what's happened. They have to show substantial injury. And I'm always fascinated by that prong of unfairness and how it gets matched up at the end to restitution or disgorgement or some other monetary remedy. How do you, how do you reconcile those things? So I think that it, um, you have to stop and think about um, it, it, the totality of what the, um, uh, the alleged conduct is and are there in fact, uh, is it purely injurious or are there benefits to the, um, you know, the product that's being marketed or something? Is there, is there, um, it, it, are, are there additional elements that have to come in to that consideration? And I think that it really is important to, to have, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an economist, so <laughs> I need to have data. <laughs> I want to look at what the data shows about consumer understanding and, um, and consumer behavior. And you can show that, if you can show with your data, the consumers understood how this product worked, or the consumers understood, or they, or, or they benefited. A, a, an example comes to mind of, um, of convenience fees for um, for payments over the phone um, so you know there are, uh, uh, if you're if you if there is some inappropriate or insufficient disclosure about the convenience fee um, and you're say maybe charging ten dollars to collect a fee over the phone um, but the borrower is avoiding a $35 late fee by doing that. Um, and even if they haven't had a full disclosure that, you know, this $10 fee is, and here's how it's going to work and so on, the, the customer is still benefited in some way. And that is, and they, it's hard to say how that's injurious when, you know, they've saved themselves $25. So I think those are the elements that you need to uh, uh, factor in and that you can bring to bear on the legal arguments as well as the restitution arguments. It's really interesting. So we talk about injury, and I want to come back to Katie for a moment, um, because the concept of injury, how consumer injury gets described in, I mean, the only way we can understand the legal framework for consumer injury is to go back and look at case law as lawyers and say, okay, here are, you know, 10 cases that say X, Y, and Z fact patterns equal consumer injury. It's not always the most satisfying exercise because it doesn't match up perfectly with the UDAP doctrine as it's evolving. What have your experiences been in this regard, Katie, in terms of trying to marry up concepts of injury in existing case law to newly forming concepts of injury under UDAP doctrine? Sure. So it's difficult. Um, you know, we see we we obviously see injury in in a ton of FTC cases, but the thing that the bureau sort of focuses on is you know, you could have a very small dollar amount injury to lots of consumers, or you could have a huge dollar amount injury to just a few consumers, and the Bureau sees those both as problematic. Um, so there's, there's not really an argument, well, you know, it only, it only costs that consumer 13 cents. Well, 13 cents across 3 million consumers is a really big deal. Um, so basically, if there's any injury to consumers, the Bureau is sort of looking at it and saying, you know, we're going to come after you regardless of, of the amount or, or the quantities. So Meredith, in terms of um, what you've experienced, and I kind of want to go back to a little bit of the beginning of the presentation when you were talking about the broken windows approach, because um, that's a concept I haven't heard in a long time, and I think it's a really apt description here. And, and, you know, this concept of consumer injury, so what makes the CFPB unique as a law enforcement agency and what's really embodied in UDAP doctrine is that the Bureau, unlike other agencies, looks at the starting point of how consumers are impacted by conduct and goes backward from there, as opposed to a lot of other agencies that start at the point of conduct and look at the impact at the end. The Bureau looks at the impact at the beginning and goes backward. And that's really important when you talk about remediation and you talk about preemptive behavior. And I'm curious how you, how you marry that idea up with what you said earlier about the broken windows approach 
And also, I mean, you know, you've got the broken windows approach, which I think is apt and right. And then you've got these very large ideas about remediating an economic world in the post-recession world. And, and how do you kind of match that up with this concept of consumer injury starting from the point of consumer impact? Right. So I think companies that are engaging with the CFPB have to have a, look at everything through that lens. And that is what may seem like a small deal could, in the eyes of the Bureau, be you know, making a mountain out of a molehill. And it, I think it pays for companies who are living in this CSPB world to make sure that incidences that are elevated or come to their attention that, you know, seem perhaps inconsequential, that they truly are inconsequential, that they truly are one-off. And if they are not, then it's incumbent upon the company to try to understand the scope of a potential problem and then make a determination on whether it is something that needs to be remediated and how they may engage with the agency or the bureau to um, discuss the problem perhaps preemptively. And so it's, it's, I think it's a very tricky dynamic and I think that the, it, it makes operating in a day-to-day -day business world difficult because it, it does seem like mistakes happen and so how do you how do you know when it's appropriate to elevate but you know it's, I think that that's the, the role of, of um, you know, people within the organization to try to suss out what the true problems are and take steps to preemptively or preemptively deal with them before they become a bigger problem or uh, take care of them and cure the problem going forward. And in your world, Jennifer, when you're talking about, you know, are you talking about human error? Are you talking about systemic compliance failures? Are systemic compliance failures deliberate, purposeful? Um, how do you, when you get asked a question about, put a number on this, right? I'm sure you get asked that question all the time. Put a number on this and you think, well, there's a lot of component parts to that. How do you how do you see those component parts matching up with UDAP right. when you get asked to put a number on it? Right. So I mean, so there's. I think when you're when you're looking at a CFPB uh, investigation or enforcement matter, I think there are kind of two numbers that you have to think about. Right. There's the number that equates to the harm that was specifically identified, um, right, the number of people who were injured times the harm, to, right, that's what we think of as damages. But I think that when, um, um, when that seems to be uh, a symptom of a broader uh, systemic problem, um, then I think you're going to have a, 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 a civil monetary penalty as well. I mean, there are, they, almost all of the enforcement actions have both. Some have just one or the other, but they almost all have a redress component and a civil monetary uh, penalty component. Um, and uh, and I think the. Um, the interplay between the two is very fascinating to me. Uh, I think that um, there have been instances that um, uh, uh, that I've been involved in where it seemed to me that the uh, the sum of the two was the important number, um, <laughs> much more so than the breakdown between the harm to consumers and the um, and the penalty. Um, I think there was a recent uh, a, a recent decision that was in the news that where that ratio is quite startling, um, where the consumer harm is very low relative to the uh, relative to the penalty amount, and I think that is exactly um, uh, uh, I think the CFPB. Uh, it's just my guess. <laughs> uh, I, I think is is making a statement about the systemic issues uh, and not about the specific harm to a small number, what relatively small number of consumers. Wearing your law enforcement hat, Meredith, um, both the defense attorney hat but your former prosecutor hat, you know, it strikes me that redress and CMP, civil money penalties, serve two distinct enforcement purposes one to make consumers whole, but the other to send a message, right? But they're really both sending a message. What are your thoughts on that and how you see that evolving with UDAP? Yeah, I, I tend to think it's quite 
directed at sending a message, um, both to the organization that's at issue to prevent any future conduct from that organization that could be you know, similar, and to also send a message to entities that are operating in the same space. And you know, my experience with respect to the FDC liability issues, and I'm not an economist, but was very similar to Jennifer's in that it seemed like the number was sometimes arbitrary and that it really was just about um, getting to a particular dollar figure and you can do all the expert analysis and come up with a really coherent, <laughs> cogent, thoughtful argument as to why their analysis is flawed and at the end of the day they didn't want to hear it. They, they're just, they, they have this you know, penalty that they want to impose or damages that they want to impose and you can try to take them to court and fight about it or you, know, you can try to resolve it in some other out of court way but at the end of the day they're going to be pretty stubborn about what they're willing to take. So one of the things that's interesting about the CFPB's uh, civil money penalty um, is that it actually is part of what's called a 1017 fund, um, which is delineated in the Dodd-Frank Act. And the 1017 fund is a fund that receives monies that are collected as part of the civil money penalty assessment in a case. And it, I think it's every quarter the CFPB looks out and says, who hasn't been remediated adequately? What consumers haven't had their, you know, been redress, have been received redress? And or what are some other worthy places that we can put this money from an education perspective? And that's very different than civil money penalties in any other context where it goes straight to the Treasury. And, and it makes the assessment of civil money penalties here, a, it, it sends a very different public statement. And I'm curious, Katie, in your looking at other law enforcement regimes and looking at analogous cases, what you've learned about the CFPB civil money penalty as a unique issue, because it's something that we have also addressed and tried to figure out. They're sending a very significant message, and it's very deliberately set up that way. Absolutely. Um, I, with civil money penalties, you know, we have seen some really big numbers um, where their consumer redress is, is not as big. Um, and, you know, it may be a symptom of being a new agency and really trying to, you know, put their stamp on their legacy and sort of how they're, they're going to move forward. But um, we've definitely seen CMP numbers that are just way, way more than you would, than you would expect and that you're seeing in other, in other contexts. And um, it's way more than you would expect because you're looking out at the world as it exists pre Dodd Frank, or as it exists from other agencies, is that fair to say? I mean, well, also, I mean, in in theory, you would think that there would be some correlation between the actual injury and the penalty, um, and that's just not. It hasn't been the case as much as you've seen in other pre Dodd Frank cases in the pre Dodd Frank world. Um, a couple of things I want to um, address. We have a CLE code for today, and it's consumer. C-O-N-S-U-M-E-R, so be sure to use that if you're seeking CLE credits. And finally, I wanted to turn to the last phase of our program today, which is really helping uh, those on the phone and other in interested parties in thinking about how they can respond to, anticipate, prevent um, potential UDAPs, potential um, instances where there's allegations of unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. And, and one of the things I want to start out, and, and I'm curious to hear what our, our um, other panelists think, is because the CFPB looks out at the point of in, impact with a consumer, that's their, that's their starting point, and they would be the first to tell you this if you ever hear a, a law enforcement or enforcement office uh, discussion with folks in that office, they'll tell you that they're different. They're looking at a, a conduct or a practice from the perspective of impact on the consumer and then let's go out from there. Um, which means in some ways it's, it's easier and also harder to anticipate um, what is a UDAP. And I'm curious, um, Jennifer, in your experience looking at this from, a, from an economist's perspective and in a damages assessment, what your thoughts are on that? Well, I th um, the thing that comes to mind in uh, many of the cases that I, I've looked at, a starting point for thinking about consumer impact comes with complaints. Um, and, and I think the CFPB looks at complaints as well uh, as a way to identify that. 
um, you know, we want to understand um, uh, when you're trying to dr when you're trying to track the consumers who have been affected. Just coming back to that, I mean, start a starting point for sizing up that population. If you can't do it immediately from your data, you can estimate it sometimes from the uh, from the complaints and from things like that. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that when you're talking about consumer complaints, that does definitely it's definitely a starting point. And if you're the CFPB, and, and this is another interesting um, topic that we could certainly spend the rest of the hour discussing or more, um, the CFPB puts a lot of weight on consumer complaints. And they say, okay, not only how do you as an institution or organization respond to consumer complaints, but how do you, you know, capture the existence of them in the first instance? And I definitely think that that's one place where they start. And to your point, that's probably a useful jumping off point for a damages analysis. Um, I'm curious, um, in your experience, Meredith, having been a prosecutor in, in the district attorney's office in New York, which of course is, is you know, one of the most robust regimes in the country, um, how, how this question of you know, how you marry up what you saw there with this question of potential UDEP violations and what your experience in looking out at the world and seeing you know, law enforcement issues how you counsel clients and say, look, this, this, and this are likely to get you into trouble um, given where the rubber hits the road. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think there's some, there are greater similarities between, say, a district attorney and the CFPB than there are between a district attorney and, say, the FDIC or the OCC. And that's because the CFPB, you know, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it's their mission is to protect individuals and so is you know these district attorney's offices whether it's New York or you know other local prosecutors they are interested in protecting individuals and so I think that that really informs the CFPB's approach to UDAP and maybe in a way that some of the other prudential regulators would not be so invest in. Um, I think that they're really looking, they, they see themselves as really looking out for the little guy. And, you know, unfortunately for the businesses that operate, you know, under the purview of the CFPB, that can be a really monumental challenge is to make sure that you too are doing everything that the CFPB expects you to do to look out for the little guy while also carrying on your business, which may be to take money from the little guy as part of a routine business transaction, whether it's collecting a loan payment or, you know, doing some other service that has an element of, you know, it's always going to be viewed with some skepticism by an agency like the CFPB. So in that sense, I, I think it's a much, the regime that the CFPB is advancing is more um, onerous than perhaps the regimes that were advanced you know, prior to the CFPB's existence by some of the other prudential regulators on banks and on, um, you know, the security dealers and so forth. I think it's just a different mindset that really triggers how they are looking at these different infractions. What are some examples, and, and we could, we have about five minutes left in our program, so I, I realize we could spend the next two hours talking about this, but what are some examples that you've seen um, in your work in this space of UDAPs? And I, and I ask that question because I think by understanding examples, you can have a better understanding of what could trigger a finding of a UDAP and how you can remediate that. Sure, and I think that this spans across various industries and you know, things like making sure disclosures really disclose what is expected of a consumer. What are they expected to pay? What are they, how often are they expected to do it? Um, how long is it going to last? Making sure all of those materials are clear and consistent. Making sure that scripts that representatives who interact with consumers on a daily basis are equally as clear and uh, concise and match up with what's in your materials, with, with, with what's in your manuals. Um, you know, if a consumer has a dispute, making sure that that dispute is you know, appropriately documented, that it's appropriately escalated if necessary, that the follow-up is um, carried out. These are all types of, of actions that companies have been dinged on, and not just dinged, but have actually faced substantial penalties for because 
uh, the CFPB has found them to be you know, unfair, deceptive, or perhaps abusive. And that may be, um, you know, as Katie was saying, really it feels more like you're taking advantage of someone. It's not just that you're, you know, your script isn't perfect. It's that you're actually going out of your way to um, sell a product to a consumer who maybe calls in asking about one question and you're leading them down the, the garden path to a product that they don't really need or perhaps can't possibly benefit from. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's those types of actions that I think are really catching the CFPD's attention and are leading them to impose these types of, of, of penalties. So we have a few minutes left and I wanted to ask all of our panelists starting with Katie to give a few parting words of advice for how companies can stay out of the UDAP crosshair, so to speak. Um, and we'll start with you, Katie. Sure. So one thing that I was going to actually say when Meredith was talking is, you know, one way for the Bureau to really see how serious companies are taking complaints and their responsibilities to consumers are how they do respond to complaints. Are they timely? Are they, do they have fulsome procedures in place? Um, so, to the extent that a company does not, I, I think one great way to stay out of the crosshairs is to implement those types of procedures, um, to always be really timely in communicating with any consumer complaint, um, anything like that. Um, so yeah, just being as responsive to consumers as, as possible and really just vetting everything before, before it ever leaves your company and goes out to the, to the public. How about you, Jennifer? So I'm going to answer just a slightly different question because yeah. I'm less involved in uh, counseling companies of staying out. But once the once the um, once the UDAP problem has started to rear its head, um, get involved with uh, your attorneys and somebody else who can think about how do we how do we query our data in the way that is going to capture all of the relevant information that we need to deal with this program, both from counting the number of people, but even figuring out, like, did people misunderstand? What can we do with that? Like, I think um, in many of the matters that I've been involved in, people thought, uh, let's just pull some data and we'll get it going. Um, and, it, and, and it leads them down a bad path, so it's not the right data, it confuses the CFPB, they're not, um, they think that it's being offered disingenuously and so on, but I think it's better to plan it all out up front. And Meredith. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to springboard off of Jennifer. I think that this ties into pay attention to the, what seems to be little things. If, if the little things look like maybe they're bigger than you thought, you need to figure out what the scope of that problem is and do examine the data and, and really try to get a handle on what the issue is and, and how you might go about addressing it. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, our presentation of UDAP, the CFPB's Emerging and Evolving Doctrine. I want to thank Jennifer McCabe, who is a Senior Vice President at Cornerstone Research and Economist there. My colleague, Meredith Boylan, who works extensively on CFPB and other consumer finance law enforcement matters. And my other colleague, Katie Wright, who similarly works on those matters as well. I'm Allison Baker from the Venable Firm, and we greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you.